This is the story of the Gravel and the Grain Company, two companies dependent on maritime transport and who wanted to become greener. The Gravel Company were shipping building materials from West Norway to Oslo, and the Grain Company, corn from Oslo to West Norway. And this is their journey to build the world's first zero emission cargo ship. They started looking for a shipping company which could offer them a green yet competitive solution. But the market at the time had no quick fix solution to offer them. The new green technology was not mature enough, or it was too expensive and risky for the shipping companies to offer it. Both companies were participants in the green shipping program, which brings together cargo owners like themselves, shipping companies offering the transport, public sector authorities and other maritime partners, all working together in the unique Norwegian approach of competing and cooperating. And through the programme, they discovered that the green solution actually did exist and was already being explored within the passenger ferry industry. The solution was hydrogen power. They also made another discovery, each other. They could achieve their green shipping goal together by using the same vessel. The Green Bulk project was born. To make the project less risky, the charter tender contract was set to run for a record 15 years, resulting in over 30 tenders being received. With no regulations for hydrogen yet in place, there was a need for some kind of guidance. In the summer of 2021, the Mahai Save project published a handbook covering the use of hydrogen. In return for funding and support, the Green Bulk project is sharing what they learn about building and using a hydrogen-powered ship, enabling future regulations to be kept updated. The story is not nearing its end. The story is just beginning. The vessel Wit Orca is now in the final stages of approval and will soon become the world's first hydrogen-powered cargo ship. That is some achievement and a story which hopefully will inspire many more to follow this unique example of Norwegian green shipping in action. Welcome back. I'm Majid Salehit, Senior Market Advisor at Innovation Norway Middle East. On behalf of Team Norway in the UAE, I would like to thank you all for joining us in this session, the second session of Sustainable Oceans Forum. We have a great lineup of, uh, lineup of speakers and subject matter uh, experts in this session. Without further ado, I would like to hand over to uh, the moderator of the session, Nikhil Itnani. He is the Honorary Secretary at IMRS UAE brand. Nikhil, the stage is yours. Thank you, Majid. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this session where we will talk about alternative fuels and hybrid-powered vessels and how they help us move towards decarbonization of shipping. My name is Nikki Lidnani. I'm the Honorary Secretary of the Institute of Marine Engineering, Science and Technology, UAE branch. I will be the moderator for this session. Thank you all for joining us, bo both uh, everybody here in person as well as those of you online. We certainly hope the next 90 minutes is valuable for what we discuss. Decarbonization is a major challenge of our times. And a collaborative approach amongst relevant stakeholders is necessary to achieve viable solutions. 
the IMO has um, imposed emission reductions, greenhouse gas emission reductions uh, by up to 50% by 2050 using 2008 as a baseline. And this has caused several ship owners to, this is a challenge for several ship owners to achieve. Perhaps having a combination of digitalization, alternative fuels, and smart solutions might lead us to this elusive green shift. At this stage, I'd like to introduce our uh, panelists. But before that, this is the broad agenda, which is up there. The first five bullet points are the 10-minute presentations which each panelist will make prior to us launching into a panel discussion, where hopefully all of you participate in. So please make note of your questions and, um, and uh, pose them to the panelists once they come up at the end. Speaking of questions, I've been uh, requested by Ian that the previous, the previous uh, session, the questions were not captured online. So uh, Ian, the moderator for the previous session, will uh, make sure that the questions are responded to uh, shortly. I got that right, yes, Ian? OK. Let's uh, get enlightened now on what is DNV's forecast for 2050, the alternative fuels. And for that, I'd like to invite on stage Mr. Pawan Sani. Pawan's the business development director for DNV's uh, Middle East and Africa region. Chief, the floor is all yours. Pawan Sani. Thank you, Nikhil. Salaam Alaikum and a good morning to all distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to make a short helicopter view presentation on DNV's maritime forecast 2050. It is part of a suite of publications as part of Energy Transition Outlook. And my focus is going to be on alternate fuels, which is the theme of this panel. The maritime forecast of 2050 has a few key highlights. The first was to identify what are the measures that need to be taken. And I'll have to turn a little because I don't think I can read <laughs> very clearly from this distance. So uh, it's, of course, each company has to make their own decarbonization stairway and the risks associated with it. And we hope that this document, which is freely available, can be a guidance document to let each ship owner find his path in the best way suited to them. Uh, of course, one of the things which is going to come in the years ahead is the cost of alternate fuels, the cost of this decarbonization. And for those of you who were here in the panel earlier, it was clear that nearly 80% of ships globally will not comply with the requirements of EXI and CII the first step of which will come in 2023. There was also the important to figure out which are the showstoppers, what are the costs associated with it, and of course, going forward, what technologies are there. One, there are no alternate fuels which have clearly been practiced besides LNG, which necessarily anyone would agree is not a green fuel or methanol tankers, which are again sailing with these. Every other fuel, it will take between four to eight years for this uh, engines or technology to be commercially viable on ships in the future. And of course, at this stage, owners who are ordering ships, they need to know what flexibility to incorporate on their designs so that they can meet the future requirements and have a ship which is commercially viable for approximately 20 years. DNV, in our assumptions, have taken certain, uh, let's say, the population growth, the GDP growth, and based on that, looking at the way the trends were going, how the fuel mix will look by 2050. And in that, if you look at it, it's going to go down to nearly 20% of old 
emission conventional fuels and the remaining mix is going to be a mixture of biofuels it's going to be some electrification and of course we are talking about when you talk about bi low carbon biofuels i think it's important to remember that the e fuels which is presently not existing is something which is going to dominate the landscape in the years ahead where essentially we'll be using electricity generated through solar panels and carbon capture to produce fuels which are essentially the same as the conventional fuels except that they are green in nature the three key fundamental drivers are increasing the pressure on decarbonization is one is of course regulations and policies and we know that the IMO regulations are not enough to decide the way forward the EU 55 has come out with their own ideas because they feel the IMO is not stringent enough to implement the let's say to achieve the climate change goals which we want to achieve we have of course access to capital and this is increasingly being driven by cargo owners by shippers who actually are asking shipping companies to prove their green credentials otherwise they will not get finance so you hear about the sea cargo charter the poseidon principles these are all drivers which is forcing ship owners to move de towards decarbonization and there the need for alternate fuels comes in i spoke on this and of course the fuel transition is shipping has started and is gaining momentum so we won't say it doesn't exist today this is to show you the new building order in 2019 so as much as six percent of the ships ordered were actually complying with all were using alternate fuels and if you look in 21 we are already talking of 12 percent so it's gone up by nearly twice as much in the last two years and if you look at the figures in july you will actually see that 14 percent of the vessels ordered in 2021 are with actually alternate fuels and here we are not including of battery power and in terms of tonnage it is 27 percent and of course this is dominated by the mega container ships the vlocs and the vlccs where it is still reasonably cost efficient to go with alternate fuels i thought it's really important to highlight the difference between gray blue and green fuels because even though the engines in the future might be using fuels which we have heard of it doesn't necessarily mean that they are green fuels because the amount of carbon emissions from uh, tank to wake is what is important so the gray fuels are what we are using today however blue fuels fuels are those where some carbon capture has taken place and these fuels are not as let's say carbon intensive as we would believe and move the fuels towards eventually green fuels where you've used solar power or other renewable means to use to produce electricity which is helping with fuels which have absolutely no carbon footprint i thought one of the biggest challenges with alternate fuels and that everyone talks about in the market is the volumetric density of the fuel and if you look at it the first one shows what a conventional fuel looks like and if you go down to people talking about ammonia and hydrogen you can see the amount of space that you need is between five to ten times of a storage of a conventional oil fuel ships and here again it's important that when you have ammonia methanol or hydrogen in your tanks you cannot fill them up full there are limits to filling them up and a tip it can at times be as low between 80 and 85 percent so the capacity of these tanks are huge and again of course looking at it purely from an energy density perspective you will suddenly see that the difference in if you take marine gas oil it's 36.6 uh, gigajoules per cubic meter and then if you go to the other end where everyone talks about hydrogen and ch2 is compressed hydrogen and lh2 is of course liquefied hydrogen you're talking of 7.5 as the energy content equivalent in terms of volume so obviously this would be a huge challenge 
for shipping companies where they do not want to lose out on cargo space because their revenue is on basically the cargo they carry. And if you are going to have such a huge volume of cargo tanks, the entire costing of a ship or a project takes on completely new dimensions. I think uh, one other aspect which is really important today is that the key few technologies for the transition do not exist today. There's a lot of pilot projects going on and it's going to take between four to eight years before you have an ammonia engine or a hydrogen engine, uh, let's say, or which is really in use. When it comes to methanol, these technology is already mature. There are a lot of ships which are sailing with methanol, but essentially they are methanol tankers. So they don't have the challenge of storage of fuel because that's the main cargo. So going forward, I can see that ship owners today don't know how to invest in what technology to invest. And that is where we believe our document, our carbon stairway will help guide them in designing ships which are flexible based on their let's say, uh, approach to alternate fuels and what they think will be the future. And again, if you look in this graph here, the red is, of course, technology doesn't exist. And I think except for methanol, where you can see there are methanol tankers running on methanol fuel, there is no real technology. And I think it's important to also highlight that fuel cells, which everybody believes is already very mature, in reality it isn't. It's still something which needs to be developed a lot of work is going on on it, but we do believe fuel cells will probably be available sometime in the near future, but again, with not enough energy density to be allowed to sail on ocean-going ships. So which is the best fuel options? And I've actually put up a small graph which, with color codes, which I think is quite self-evident. And I think if you look at the conventional oil tank, oil fuel, except the green credentials, everything else is well matured. And if at the lower end, if you go to ammonia and hydrogen, you'll find hydrogen has nearly all aspects to be developed in the years to come. Ammonia carriers do exist today. There are ammonia storage facilities. So in a way, at least that aspect of that fuel is covered, but ammonia is highly toxic. And the challenges with that in an enclosed machinery space is something which still needs to be I would say in a way figured out, but we have heard of designs with hydrogen as a fuel where they have located it on top of the ship to prevent an explosion hazard. With that, come to the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Pawan. Very interesting. I think your last slide is where we're going to get some questions from. So we will move on to our next, uh, our next panelist, uh, Lars Andre. Gimestad, I hope I got that name right. As I say, a rose by any other name is still a rose. Uh, Lars, Lars is going to tell us about what is the route to zero emission vessels. Welcome on board, Lars. All yours. Thank you, Nikhil. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you to uh, the Norwegian team, uh, or Team Norway here in uh, Dubai, for uh, setting up this conference and also for hosting our our stand uh, here at the exhibition. I'm very happy to be here. Um, just to uh, narrow down the scope a little bit, uh, when, it, when the title is Route to Zero Emission, it sounds like I'm going to talk uh, broadly about vessels, but let me nar narrow down to uh, passenger vessels, uh, which I will come back to. Uh, and also, I will sort of try to tell the story from our perspective as a shipyard and the way that we have chosen, or the way that we the route that we are on towards uh, zero emission uh, vessels. Um, yeah, this is uh, one of our vessels just to, to show you uh, sort of the products that we are producing. This is where we are located. This is our main yard. And uh, being in a place like this, you obviously feel committed to contributing to sustain uh, that kind of environment. Uh, we have a nature to protect. And uh, we feel very committed to, uh, to, uh, to conduct our activity and also to introduce products that ha can contribute to, to um, maintain the planet as we see it in this picture. 
Uh, we are an integrated shipyard, meaning that we are designing and producing vessels, uh, turnkey vessels from our facility. Um, the um, sort of the core technology of our products is the fact that we are using carbon fiber as the building material. So all our vessels are, um, are built in purely in carbon fiber. And the reason for this is that we see one of the uh, sort of uh, critical aspects when it comes to, to um, obtaining zero emission is to focus on energy efficiency. And when you, um, uh, when you are certainly talking about high-speed vessels, weight is critical. So we, uh, we have chosen carbon fiber and been producing uh, some uh, 70 vessels since uh, 2001 um, of different sizes. And uh, the, the initial sort of motivation for doing that was to save fuel, regular fuel. Um, carbon fiber is um, high strength, low weight. It reduced fuel costs. It reduced emissions, certainly with the um, increasing attention on low and zero emission. This has sort of been a, a very good sort of side effect of the initial cost focus that, uh, that this material um, brought, uh, brought on. Um, the material is also very positive in terms of maintenance and it gives a very high second-hand value for, for the operator. Um, in a combination with material, you also have to work on the, uh, the hull design and to obtain highly efficient vessels. So the, the video here is showing a ferry operating at 40 knots on, on diesel. Uh, I have to say, but still it's, um, it represents a 40% reduction in fuel consumption compared to other vessels of the same design in other materials. So this is sort of the phase one of, of uh, going zero is to focus on energy efficiency. Uh, this brings us to sort of introducing uh, another way of carrying the energy. And uh, this vessel was um, a concept that we uh, made in 2016. Um, and the first version of this vessel was a hybrid, where we introduced battery combined with diesel uh, engines. And at that time, this is already five years ago since, uh, since this vessel wa was launched, um, we, uh, we um, installed a battery package of 600 kilowatt hours. But just two years after, the introduction of this vessel, we built vessel number two, which was a fully electric vessel. We could call that phase three. And uh, the, the energy density of batteries during that time doubled. So we were able to install close to two megawatt hours of, of electricity onto the vessel. And it enables the vessel to go somewhere around 25 nautical miles in 16 knots and uh, 46, uh, 45, 46 nautical miles in 10 knots, so it's, it's optimal for, for sightseeing. Uh, moving on, we uh, delivered last year um, another electric vessel where we have sort of worked to optimize energy efficiency and we have also increased the size of the battery pack to make the vessel go even faster. So now we're moving into the so-called high-speed segment or high-speed vessel segment by definition. Uh, so this vessel was, um, was during testing capable of doing 24 knots uh, of speed um, in operation. So we're moving now into the, um, the high-speed uh, area. But electricity, batteries, there comes a few challenges, certainly with respect to, uh, to charging. The grid, the power grid is not able to to um, support the kind of uh, energy that is needed to fast charge these vessels. So one of the sort of mitigating uh, um, um, installations we have made is the so-called power dock, where we pre-charge batteries uh, in this floating dock. So when the vessel is docking, we can fast charge the vessel fr with, from the battery pack uh, in, the, in, the, um, in this uh, construction 
combined with power from the grid. Another way of mitigating uh, the charging challenge is um, a concept that we're working together now with a Norwegian operator. That's to create a battery swap solution. So this one is uh, something that we will introduce hopefully in the market uh, shortly. Um, and it sort of uh, works the same way as the, uh, the um, power dock I showed you, but this one is uh, where you replace batteries when you, uh, when you dock the vessel. In a, in a couple of minutes, you can swap uh, two megawatt hours of, of, of power. And further on, we are, mo uh, we are moving uh, forward on the energy efficiency uh, work with uh, creating new design, more aer aerodynamic designs, and also introducing solar panels on, on the vessels. These three vessels uh, are due to be delivered early next year to, to an operator in Greece. So, but, and there we are also optimizing the weight and, and the, um, and the uh, total energy efficiency of the vessels. And we are also moving into autonomous uh, and the digitalization because we see that that's also can represent a contribution in terms of efficient operation of vessels in the future. Total autonomy for passenger vessels we see that that will take uh, some time before that is, uh, is uh, applicable, but um, it will certainly come at some stage. But uh, with passenger safety and all that, we think that total autonomy is, is, is somewhere uh, far in the, into the future. But it will contribute to energy efficiency and machine learning and all that. That will be a positive aspect of, of, uh, of that uh, development. And uh, hydrogen has been uh, mentioned. We also see that for the longer distances, the highest speeds, uh, an energy carrier like uh, hydrogen will, be, um, will come at some stage. But like uh, was pointed out in, in the previous uh, presentation, uh, it's costly and there are some uh, bunkering issues and, and things like that. So we, uh, we are following the development, but uh, we, we don't see it in the near future on, on high-speed vessels uh, today. Well, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lars. Thank you. Very interesting videos, Thank yes. You. Please take a seat next to Pawan. And welcome to the modern city of Dubai. But now we move to the oldest city in Norway, where our next speaker is joining us, uh, Andre Hogstad, Ho Andre Hogsrod, and he's the sales manager maritime for, uh, at Kongsberg. Uh, Andre, do you read us yeah. loud and clear? Can you hear me? Certainly we can. Over to you, Andre. All right, thank you very much. Sorry I couldn't be there in, in person today, but I have to do it from my, from my home office. Um, so I'll try to share my screen. Tell me if you can see it, yeah? Yes. Yeah, good. Uh, so my agenda is uh, today hybrid and short-term solutions for reduced, uh, reducing emissions. Um, of course, it's obvious that we have to focus on, on alternative fuels. So we have to develop the te technology, the uh, competence and the infrastructure for alternative fuels. Uh, but if we look at the next slide, there is a lot of solutions or pass, pass to uh, reduce emissions. So I, I categorized uh, them in four groups. You can see the alternative fuels. You have solutions for reducing the amount of engines online, run with, with fewer engines on higher loads, uh, on load levels where they are much more efficient than today's load levels. <clears throat> you have solutions to reduce the average base loads on board, and you have solutions for increasing your production or efficiency. And what I mean by that is, uh, for example, drill faster, go faster from A to B, load and offload faster, less off-fire time, and so on. So these are all solutions that can also bring you to a, a, a more efficient and uh, environmental friendly uh, operation. So if we look at the alternative fuels uh, for some uh, vessel segments of some markets, it's going to be a long-term solution. Um, so what can we do with the short-term goals? Because we have goals for 2023, 2030, and so on. And 
we need to focus for these market segments and these vessel uh, types, we probably need to look at the short term uh, solutions. So we're going to look at a few of these ones, which I, I think is going to be they are uh, quite easy to adopt and they're going to give you a substantial amount of savings. OK, it's not going to bring you all the way to uh, zero emission, but it brings you closer to the goals and the new requirements coming now. So the first one is energy storage solution. And of course, there is there's some uh, some um, different types of needs or requirements. If you look at this, there is three main ones. Yep, the first one is spinning reserve. So it's typically something for DP position vessels. You need the batteries as a backup in case you have a partial blackout on one of your switchboards, right? The next one is zero emission. So typically ferries and stuff like that, going from A to B purely on battery. And the third one is peak shaving. So it's typically to handle load variations on board. Um, and this is probably a, 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 um, a feature that we need also for the alternative fuels. We're gonna see that on the next slide. So let's look at uh, some practical use of batteries. So the first one is to be able to handle fluctuating loads. So we can use the battery for peak shaving the loads from heavy consumers. It can be cranes, it can be drilling equipment, it can be uh, hydraulic power units and so on. Uh, if we look at the alternative fuels, like fuel cells, they are quite bad at handling dynamic loads, load changes. And that's also what we see on other other types of fuels like uh, like uh, solar and wind and so on. They're, they're not good at handling load variations. So we're probably going to need to have batteries as part of those alternative fuel solutions also to be able to handle those load fluctuations. We can also generate, regenerate power from heavy consumers because typically we see on cra heavy, heavy cranes and drilling equipment that you normally burn off quite a lot of energy on breaking resistors that we can put into the batteries instead. Next one, harbor modes. So while you're in harbor, of course, in the future, you probably need to have shore power. Um, so while in, in harbor, you can charge your batteries from shore power if you have um, more power demand on board than you have available power from shore, you can use the batteries to complement that shore power in periods. If you are in a harbor without shore power, you can use the batteries to run purely on batteries, and then you can have automatic start and stop of an engine based on the state of charge of the battery system. Um, you can have en uh, batteries as, as a backup energy. Of course, like uh, I mentioned on DP station vessels, you use this for spinning reserve. You can also use the, the battery energy backup as supplement for charter requirements, because often we see that your contract requires that you need to run, for example, two engines in port while in crane operations and stuff like that. But the batteries can probably make you comply with the charter, even though you run only one engine in port. And you can use the batteries for blackout recovery. <clears throat> and of course, we have the zero emission, where you have pure electric passages run from A to B on, on batteries. You can have electric um, uh, uh, steaming in and out of ports because if you see that there is starting to get uh, quite strict in some areas, you cannot emit in ports, you cannot emit in fjords and so on. Um, and you can have a uh, run on pure battery when you are in low power but demand situation like in standby mode uh, during a mobilization and so on. Uh, and here we're going to see some of Kongsberg's unique solutions. So the first one is that we have an energy management system, which is basically an integration of the heavy consumers, the dynamic positioning system, and the power management system. And the reason for doing this is we want to be able to control the energy flow optimally aboard the vessel. We want the energy, as much of the energy, to go directly from the producers to the consumers, from the engines to the propellers. Um, because every kilowatt you produce on board, you are going to invest a certain amount of liters of fuel. If you put that kilowatt into a battery and take it out later, you're going to lose approximately 15% of that investment. So take the energy, as much of it, directly from the producers to the consumers, and then uh, you're going to see reduced electrical losses and also increased battery lifetime. Uh, Kongsberg has our own uh, battery technology. We have developed it. And we can put it into our own uh, design deck houses in many sizes and versions. Um, 
and we have another unique solution called Power Allocator. Uh, it's uh, specifically designed for DP3 uh, vessels. Uh, and the unique thing about it is that you can use one battery for almost everything you need on board. So you can reduce the space, weight, cost, and extent of the conversion. You never lose any battery power upon the worst case single failure. And there is also another benefit. You can transfer power between redundancy zones on board without converting the vessel to closed bus. The next solution we're going to look at is hybrid shaft generator. On the upper um, illustration, you can see typically how many, many vessels are designed when they were, were built. You have a large shaft engine powering uh, a propeller, and then you have auxiliary engines powering uh, um, consumers like auxiliaries, hotels, tunnel thrusters, and so on. So you typically run the main engine and one or two of the auxiliaries. Now, these small auxiliary engines, they are much worse when it comes to efficiency, how much fuel they burn to produce a, 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 any kilowatt hours. What about putting a, a hybrid shaft generator in line on the shaft? Now you can use that very efficient large engine to also power auxiliaries, hotels, tunnel thr thrusters, and so on. Another be benefit is that you don't need to run the engines on fixed speeds. You can operate the engines on optimal RPM, and you can, um, with this gearbox, operate the propeller on variable speed. Um, you can have uh, the, uh, the um, large engine running in parallel with auxiliaries. Um, you can operate the shaft generator as a generator or as a motor. So in, ca in case this one breaks down, you can actually run an auxiliary engine to power the propeller. So it gives you a take me home feature in case you have a problem with the main, main engine. If you have more than one engine and propeller, maybe you have two shaft uh, uh, engines and propellers, you can use one to power the other one. So you can run on the one large engine. So you get reduced fuel consumption and reduced emission in all modes. And we can we see that it's quite substantial. It can, can be 20 to 50% savings. There's a lot of modes we can implement. Um, just an illustration. <clears throat> uh, then we have some um, intelligent solutions for optimized voyage and station keeping. The first one, uh, these are called Vessel Performance and Eco Advisor. The first one, the Vessel Performance, is something designed for merchant market. Eco Advisor is designed for offshore market, typically for vessels with DP system. And the idea is that we want to inspire or advise the crew to op uh, operate optimally within the vessel's co uh, operational constraints. We want them to stop the engines as, as soon as they can without uh, sacrificing safety. We want them to stop thrusters and so on to save fuel. We'll also monitor consumption, emissions, and performance in all, all the modes. And we'll have real-time data and fleet comparison, both onboard and off onshore in your office. Uh, the second thing is that we want to optimize the ship performance. So we have systems to, to monitor hull performance and hull growth. We have systems to uh, monitor propeller slip and torque on the shaft line. And we have the advisory system for uh, giving you a recommendation for optimal draft and trim in, um, in transfer. And we have systems for health and condition monitoring so that you can predict failures before they actually occur so that you can limit off-fire situations. And of course, if you can use condition-based maintenance, you can prolong the, the uh, window between maintenance periods. And um, the next one is intelligent route planning. We want to be able to, to have the route as optimal as possible. Uh, so it's important to, to, uh, to look at voyage planning. We want to compensate for the weather and the sea currents. We want to make, it, make sure that we arrive just on time. We don't want to come into the port two hours early because then you, you wasted fuel. And we have systems for situation awareness and collision avoidance also during uh, a uh, route. And the last one is automatic crossing and docking. So the first one is uh, automatic docking, which controls automatically the acceleration, deceleration, the transit speed, and track of the vessel to be able to optimize it uh, so that's it, as efficient as it uh, possibly can. And the second one is automatic docking, um, which the captain doesn't need to do anything. It goes into dock automatically, and it's 
to be able to do that, do that safely and uh, in a regular um, um, uh, yeah, so that you, you do it uh, equally uh, every time and it, you don't uh, damage the vessel and so on. We have some other solutions also, briefly going to touch on them. Shore connection is going to be a requirement in the future. We have our own range of shore connection solutions from low voltage to high voltage. We integrate them into our hybrid solutions and also the control systems. Uh, optimized propulsion, we see that many vessel, the vessels, they change their operations, their, um, their operational profile during the lifetime. Maybe a vessel was initially uh, built for purely for station keeping. Now it do does more transfers. So replacing the thrusters to, to, uh, to match the current uh, operational profile of the vessel can save quite a lot. We can also convert to modern and more efficient propulsion, for example, our permanent magnet uh, thrusters. And of course, once we see that uh, restrict, it's going to be new uh, rules and regulations. Maybe you have to restrict or limit the load on the main engines so that you have to run on, on lower RPM, for example. Then why not do uh, reblading of the propeller so that it's optimal for the, within the new, um, new restrictions from the regulations. And we also have a few, uh, full LNG fuel concept. OK, it's not going to bring you to, to zero emission, but you know, it's uh, running on standard LNG is like 30% less CO2 and, and almost 100% less NOx compared to um, marine diesel fuel. Uh, but why go to LNG today? Uh, I believe it's because this infrastructure, um, it's, you can easily convert it to to the new uh, types of fuel that you see on the on the spreadsheet or the presentation, because LNG has the same uh, characteristics as a lot of these fuels. So the tank, the processing plant, the engine can probably quite easily be converted to to run on these uh, few fuels in the future. So that's it for uh, for me. Andre Dusentak. Please stay uh, online. We will have you join the panel shortly. Our thank you. Our next uh, our next panelist is Dr. Natalie Gupta. Ah, oh, oh, sorry. We are. This is yours already. Okay, I, I reacted too fast. I had my timekeeper waving her. Uh, there you go, Natalie. Thank you. All yours from Yara. She's the director for bunkering at for bunkering at uh, Yara. All yours. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Everything green. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, to the previous panelists. And again, I want to uh, join my fellow panelists to thank the Norwegian team. They've been absolutely wonderful over the past three days, and thank you very much for hosting us as well. So, um, as introduced, my name is Natalie Gupta, and I'm actually quite new to Yara. I've only been in the company for a couple of months. And uh, I'll be speaking about ammonia, which, as uh, our colleague from DNV mentioned, is one of the alternative fuels that are being considered going forward. So, and I'm going to speak about ammonia from the point of view of a company that uh, knows ammonia very, very well. Um, and for those of you who don't know about Yara, Yara is one of the largest crop nutrition companies in the world. It is a Norwegian company, the headquartered in Oslo. And um, of course, one of their key um, product is fertilizers. And the key link between fertilizers and ammonia, of course, is that ammonia as a molecule is an input to the production of fertilizer. As a result, uh, Yara being one of the largest producers of fertilizers in the world, Yara is also one of the largest producers of ammonia in the world. And not only, but Yara is the largest shipper of the molecule worldwide. Um, these are just basic statistics about the company. So Yara as a company um, 
is, uh, has been working a lot on championing the decarbonization of the shipping sector. And there are essentially three core pillars to this that are um, worthwhile mentioning in this context. One is Yara Marine Technologies, which is a fully owned subsidiary of Yara International. And my colleague from Yara Marine Technologies spoke in the earlier panel session and I believe will also be speaking in the next session. Yara Clean Ammonia, which is not a separate business, but it's a unit within Yara International, and it is very recently set up. It was set up in February 2021. I am working within that unit. And then we also have Yara Birkland, which is the world's first fully electric and autonomous container vessel, uh, which will start operations next year. So today, I'm speaking specifically in the context of the work that we are doing within Yara Clean Ammonia. So Yara Clean Ammonia is essentially combining three different pillars of the supply chain with respect to ammonia as a molecule. The first is production of the molecule, and um, this involves the production of hydrogen and the production of ammonia. Yara, as I said, is one of the largest producers of the molecule. Uh, as a company, it produces the molecule in 17 different locations. And the key projects that are being pursued today that I will briefly mention has to do with replacing the existing way in which ammonia is produced, which is essentially powered through natural gas to powering this process using renewable energy. That uh, replacement is the key factor that would allow the shift from what we have today, which is gray ammonia, to what we want to have in the future, which is green ammonia. To do this, Yara has a head start in commissioning green projects in that context since it, it already owns and operates existing ammonia plants. The second segment of that, of course, is shipping the molecule. And Yara, as I said, is the largest sh shipper of the molecule as of today. The vast majority of ammonia that is currently produced today is consumed at site. Namely, the ammonia is produced and is immediately introduced in the process to produce fertilizers. However, a part of the market overall is traded. Ammonia, as of today, is a globally traded commodity. And as my previous speaker also mentioned, the infrastructure concerning that sh uh, shipping of the molecule already exists. Yara has, uh, is a global asset back trader. It is a global export capacity with multiple downstream solutions and industrial solutions. And again, we also have the storage dimension and Yara has um, 18 marine ammonia terminals worldwide. So essentially Yara clean ammonia as a unit is trying to develop and link the production side, the upstream, the shipping side and the downstream. And today, specifically, I wanted to mention the activities concerning the bunkering of the fuel. This is just a brief slide to give some background to where ammonia is produced, where ammonia is shipped. And uh, as you can see, the existing assets concentrate in three different areas, namely Asia with um, production in um, Australia, in Europe, and in uh, the Americas. Yara also owns a fleet uh, as well as charters. So going back to the decarbonization um, agenda, there's, as we saw, a lot of different options that are available but ultimately, particularly 2013 onwards, the real option that faces owners is switching fuels. 
That is ultimately the solution that will allow uh, extensive abatement of emissions. So in the context of the options around different fuels, as we know, there are several options that are being discussed currently. And within Yara, we believe ammonia is the best in a number of areas. Of course, that said, we are all, I think, aware and conscious of the fact that the future is multi-fuel. So absolutely, ammonia is not necessarily the solution for the global fleet overall, but it is a very good solution. And part of the work that, as an industry, we need to do now is to understand where ammonia can be the best solution the fastest. Just a quick roundup on ammonia as a molecule. Um, it is a very good zero carbon shipping fuel option for a number of reasons, but in addition to that, it's a very good hydrogen carrier, and this has partly to do with its characteristics as a molecule. Ammonia is easier to store. Uh, it uh, stores at minus 33 centigrades compared to hydrogen. Um, it is more energy dense than hydrogen, which is the discussion we had earlier uh, regarding the density of the different fuels. Unlike bio-based fuels, ammonia is scaled depending on renewables. Namely, it is a scalable solution. The only bottleneck around scalability is the amount of renewable energy that is required to produce the hydrogen. And finally, unlike methanol and synthetic fuels, ammonia does not contain a carbon um, molecule inside. Ammonia is essentially a compound of hydrogen and nitrogen. Shipping is not the only sector that is looking to ammonia as an option. There are very, various other sectors that are looking into it, but within Yara Clean Ammonia at the moment, we are focusing on shipping. Just to mention, if we think about that map that I showed you, Yara is pioneering on the downstream side through three key pilot projects. One is in Pilbara, Australia, and of course, this will be a good supply options when it comes to the Asian market. And here, we're in cooperation with NG, looking at the production of green ammonia, namely ammonia that is produced using hydrogen that is itself produced using renewables. Um, and obviously, this is powered by solar energy. We are also piloting a project in Sluskil in the Netherlands, and here we're using offshore wind. And again, this is for the purposes of producing green ammonia. And again, in Poshkun in Norway, and of course, this is powered by hydropower. These are pilot projects. So essentially, what we are looking here is to prove to the market that green ammonia, the molecule, can be produced and is an option. So this was the upstream. The downstream is, of course, crucial. And uh, Yara is core business, is agriculture. Shipping is a relatively new segment for uh, Yara. And here we are working towards several projects. We have examples of collaborations that include the Castor Initiatives, which uh, includes the Port Authority of Singapore. The Port of Jurong has also recently joined, and here we are looking at the building of uh, ammonia-propelled tanker using um, combustion engines. Uh, Ship FC, which was also mentioned earlier in the presentation with concerns offshore supply vessel, and here we're looking at fuel cells, ammonia fuel cells. We also have an MOU with Trafigura, looking at various options around the um, downstream side of things, and also bunkering network, which is developing the actual bunkering solutions for ammonia. So the key message here that I wanted to put to uh, cross is the importance of collaboration. So if anybody in the room and, of course, um, listening online want to discuss about ammonia and understand more about the molecule and 
look into possible collaborations, uh, Yara Clean Ammonia has been established and is there for that purpose. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natalie. Please take a seat next to Lars. I think this whole discussion has been dominated by Scandinavia. And I noticed some of my Arab friends even walked away. But the next speaker is going to pull the power back into the Middle East. And for that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Jamil Alali. He's the manager for uh, projects and marine agency branch for KOTC, Kuwait Oil Tanker Company. For those of you who know KOTC, it's uh, really operating very high-end ships. I've had the pleasure of uh, being on some of them myself, so I can speak from first-hand knowledge. But welcome on board, Chief. All yours, Jamil. So I'd like to uh, give you a, a ship owner's perspective on uh, the path towards uh, zero, net zero, um, on our decarbonization path. Sorry. Now, just to uh, keep focus on uh, the reason why we're decarbonizing, because there's a lot of other issues with the fuel. Um, in recent years, the focus was on uh, sulfur, uh, was on uh, NOx, SOx and NOx, etc. Now, however, when we're talking about reducing the carbon footprint and reaching a net zero, we're talking about greenhouse, greenhouse, greenhouse gas effect and climate change. So, um, you know, we're talking about limiting the temperature rise. Um, previously, um, people used to talk about global warming. These days, uh, climate change is the more uh, common term used. So uh, UV rays shine down, heat up the Earth's surface. Some are radiated away and some remain. And that uh, is causing um, an average global temperature rise. Um, and we're looking at one and a half degrees, um, which is the Paris, in line with the Paris uh, uh, Agreement. Um, now, uh, IMO, in its fourth uh, uh, it's a bit small for me to see. <laughs> okay. Um, in its fourth study, in, conducted in 2020, it saw that um, over, uh, just over a thousand million tons of CO2 were produced from international shipping in 2018, um, which is approximately less than 3% of the total um, CO2 produced. Um, so, you know, as, as, a ship, as a ship owner's perspective, we could say, well, we're much better than the airline industry. We're already doing very well, so why should we, you know, do too much, you know, business as usual? Um, however, I strongly believe that um, this is the right approach to uh, all collaborate together and uh, work towards the net zero by 2050. Um, but there's uh, some challenges on the way which we have to overcome and I think those could be more uh, easily overcome by collaboration. It's not, uh, you know, sh uh, I've heard a lot of uh, mention uh, ship owners, uh, you know, ship owners choice and ship owners that. Now, it is a complex, um, it is a complex uh, combination of uh, so many things and uh, it's not only the ship owner alone. You know, we need supply of these alternative fuels. We need the technology providers who will develop these uh, technologies going, going forward. Um, okay, the ship owner I would agree has a vital role to play, but that is not the only role. Now, um, IMO has uh, you know, been uh, um, 
coming out with legislation to um, uh, encourage uh, or uh, mandate reduction of uh, uh, carbon um, and uh, carbon footprint, uh, such, such as um, EDI, Energy Efficiency Design Index for new ships, and uh, ca Carbon uh, Intensity Index, um, looking at the reduction of 40% um, by 2030, 70% uh, reduction by 2050, uh, compared with the baseline of uh, 2008. Um, however, it is expected that um, before we can head down this path, we have to peak uh, at a certain level, and then later on we will uh, uh, go down the trajectory as uh, many uh, people are predicting with various different uh, energy mixes and etc. And uh, we should reach 50% by 2050. Um, Now, the ultimate uh, target should be the, the net zero emissions by, uh, by 2050. Now, in order to reach the, the net zero, we're talking about, or by reaching uh, net zero, we're talking about limiting one and a half to one and a half degrees um, of temperature rise. Um, which is the average global air temperature, um, which would relate to 45% reduction in CO2 by 2030, and according to the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, 25% um, would limit the temperature rise of, to two degrees, uh, as opposed to one and a half degrees, which is the actual uh, target for net zero. Now, you know, uh, IMO recently in its um, MEPC meeting, which was, um, I believe, November, uh, November this year, uh, last month, um, there were many countries lobbying for um, a net zero target by 2050. However, unfortunately, um, not all countries have the same strong commitment to uh, environmental as, as uh, such countries like Norway um, or, or on the list were also backing it was the USA, Japan and Panama. Now, Panama being a, a large ship owning nation, you know, you would say, well, why, you know, often um, the big ship owning nations are afraid of uh, you know, imposing too strict regulations on shipping because it can, uh, you know, uh, push uh, ship owners away from their flag. However, I think I would um, highly commend uh, Panama for being a large ship owning nation. However, going down the uh, supporting the route of uh, uh, net zero. Um, uh, and, and obviously the other countries, and uh, as we heard today, UAE is also very strong in uh, uh, going uh, very uh, forward thinking and um, exemplary in their approach towards uh, the path towards decarbonization. Um, uh, this is just uh, sh uh, talking about the same, the, the same MEPC meeting, which is obviously the shipping body referred to over there is the IMO uh, under the auspices of the United Nations and um, uh, you know the, the the outcome of that meeting was that we will maintain the status quo we will not uh, not actually uh, impose this but reconsider again in 2023 so hopefully in 2023 I hope they will adopt the, the zero, uh, net zero um, t as a target for 2050. Now, so much talk about uh, alternative fuels and uh, 
you know, but it's a, it's a complicated mix because it's not the fuel alone, it's the technology which is, uh, you know, available to use that uh, fuel and it's also um, the infrastructure of refueling stations. Uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, also as, as seen energy, uh, uh, today, uh, the density of such fuels, uh, ship, from a ship owner's perspective, you're not ready to give up cargo carrying capacity, which was very well uh, stated earlier, uh, to carry uh, loads of fuel around the world. It de defeats the object. Um, so um, biogas, bio uh, diesel, and alcohol fuels, methanol and others have been mentioned today. And uh, this uh, also we've seen, you know, the drive towards um, uh, it, we are moving in the right direction and uh, hopefully we will reach net zero by 2050. And with that said, I will not dwell on uh, too much about alternative fuels since we've covered them already uh, in, my previous, in the previous uh, panelists' um, speeches. So uh, with that, I'll say thank you very much. Shukran Jamil. I think it was uh, very interesting that you established why we're talking about decarbonization to start off with. So thanks for bringing us back to our feet on the ground. Uh, you, also, you also spoke about collaboration, which I saw was a common thread with, with all the speakers, with all the panelists. And speaking of panelists, it's time to open up the floor for questions. Uh, I have a few guiding points on, on this matter. So. Firstly, when you come up to ask your question, please identify yourself. When I say come up, uh, literally it means come up because you need to come up to two mics located here and, uh, and please uh, then ask your question. Uh, please keep the question short. Yeah? If you have three questions, you're most welcome to ask them, but please ask one question, pause, let the answer come through and then you move on to number two. Please keep it short. Remember, we are up on stage and we're trying to, th there's a lot of stuff going on in the mind. So keep it short and keep it sharp. Um, it's not only questions, your comments and your, some experiences are most welcome. So again, when you come up, please, you don't really have to ask a question only. Maybe you can make a comment or, or, or anything else. So, so the floor is actually now open. So anybody who has uh, a question up their sleeve, something? Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Ole Johansson Weid. I'm uh, the Commissioner General for Norway Pavilion at Expo. You have to come to visit the pavilion, focus on Norway as a pioneer for sustainable ocean solutions, next to the entrance of, uh, of opportunity. Uh, but I have a question. Uh, that goes to Pawan at uh, DNV. Um, some years back, we met in Indonesia. You we were heading DNV's operations there. During that period, there was a lot of focus on, on LNG as a fuel for deep sea shipping. A, 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 a very important topic during that period was how to find bunkering for that LNG. Now we have the same issue when it comes to other types of fuels. And, and I feel that we haven't addressed the bunkering issue here. So that's why I, I, I would like to, to ask the panel here, and we can start with Pawan, what about bunkering for facilities for deep sea shipping? For short sea shipping, I, I guess it's, it's quite okay, but for deep sea shipping, when it comes to ammonia, when it comes to hydrogen and so forth, what are the plans and, and what are the, let's say, the prospects for, for bunkering? Bunker. Ole, it's a very fair, I think it's a very good question. And I can, going back to Indonesia, actually, there was a big interest in small-scale LNG. And eventually, the route they went with was with FSRUs because they needed gas to fuel their, uh, the power for the country, and they used the FSRU routes. But coming back to LNG bunkering, I can tell you that the number of bunkering vessels has been rapidly increasing. Uh, we know that for all these new mega container ships, Total has already signed a contract with CMA, CGM, et cetera, to provide them bunker fuel in most of the main hub points globally. 
Shell is aggressively doing the same, and I know that there are LNG bunker vessels already in Houston, in Korea, in China. Singapore is going to have one very soon, which is being built by Pavilion Energy, and of course, Rotterdam too has it. So I think in our report, which I talked about, there is also, and also on our AFI website, it's an alternate fuel website, where actually you can see live statistics of bunker vessels. And if I remember correct, between 2018 to 2021, the number of bunker vessels have gone up five times. But of course, these are just a, a small numbers, so the statistics look very big. But as far as LNG bunkering infrastructure is there, I think a lot of action and work is being done by the main oil majors. However, when it comes to bunkering for ammonia and hydrogen, I think that's one of the big challenges of infrastructure. Ammonia at least has storage facilities. With hydrogen, we are more or less starting from scratch. Not sure I answered all your questions, but Ole, I hope that's a good start. Uh, Pawan, since you're on the mic, uh, and you, thanks for sharing the Energy Outlook report of DNV. Is it in the public domain that we could access? Yes, actually it's on our website, and there is a suite of publications, Energy Transition. It also, we have Pathway to Zero Emission, that means our way of supporting ship owners, how they can go on their stayway of decarbonization. Yes, your, your boss mentioned about one of my favorite rock bands. He talked about the stairway to heaven. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> many made references to that. Any <laughs> other question here? Uh, Fazal, you're up next, sir. Good afternoon. Fazl, Fazl Boy from Synergy Offshore, Dubai. A question to the panel, and maybe Pavan can start or anybody else can answer as well. With all of this conundrum about which future fuel, um, that there's the almost, you, you're a naughty boy if you stay conventional, but you need to look at green and alternate fuels, but there is no clear path as to which will become the basic fuel and the standard fuel going forward. So what is your advice to a ship owner today who wants to build a ship over the next three to five years? Where is he going to make his investment decision and how can he gamble on that future? So what's your advice to the ship owning community? I think looking at the costs involved, I don't think DNB would make uh, a strong recommendation. I think when we talked about collaboration, the ship owner has to find the best solution but we do know that LNG is a fuel in transition or a transitional fuel. Dual fuel engines are readily available. They are in use. We know that the LNG has a robust infrastructure. And of course, in our same report, there is a comparison of different types of technologies and what an owner should look at. I think the best option based on our a maritime forecast in 2050 was to have a dual fuel engine, which is of course with LNG, with the ammonia option worked on. So basically, ammonia ready, or you could, I don't think there's anything really hydrogen ready today, but ammonia ready, that had, we had some figures with statistics, with pricings, I don't have them on top of my head, but that was the best economical option for a ship owner who's planning to op order a ship today. But of course, this is, like I said, there is, this is devel technological development and progress where we'll really know the results in four and eight years. This is what I think is vis visible today, but none of us should be surprised if there is an altogether completely new solution far out in the future. Uh, La Lars uh, uh, Brodrene O, oh, hmm. I got the name right? Correct. Cool. <laughs> Uh, you're a shipyard, and perhaps I, I would have normally asked you to because the, you're best suited to respond to that. So yeah. how, how would you say uh, Fazal's very, how would you respond to Fazal's very valid question? Well, I, I understand that m uh, most of the issues are, we are talking about here is, is uh, deep sea shipping. So that's sort of another story. We are in the short sea shipping industry and, and uh, on, on passenger transport. And uh, what we see is that uh, battery is actually the, 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 the energy carry, carrying uh, solution that is sort of coming more and more into our segment. And uh, we are looking now at projects, uh, passenger transport projects, where we can 
go up into 150 nautical miles on, on, uh, on electric uh, uh, powertrains. And w it will be interesting now in the coming years to see the energy density of batteries uh, developing because that's, that's uh, obviously crucial. Uh, currently we are talking about um, eight tons, metric tons per megawatt hour. Uh, and you know, for fast ferries, high-speed ferries, weight is crucial. So, uh, so uh, we very much look forward to the further development of, of um, density of the of the batteries uh, for the coming years. Looking at long-range, uh, high-speed, 30 knots plus, and and very long-range we will have to look at uh, other solutions like hydrogen uh, for, for, uh, to, to, to carry that amount of energy needed. Um, and we think that at some point hydrogen will come, but there are some obstacles uh, with regards to safety, with regards to uh, the cost, obviously, and, and also the bunkering uh, side of it. So there are, um, uh, hi yeah, in, in the, in the short term, we think that batteries is the, uh, the way forward now, uh, mitigating a little bit with, uh, with, um, uh, with um, uh, hybrid solutions, like allow some, some fossil fuel, diesel, uh, but uh, in, the, in the more mid-term uh, perspective, uh, we think that uh, electricity will, will prevail. Uh, it was, yeah, yeah uh, I just wanted to add to the discussion and to uh, Mr. Fazel's uh, question. Um, you know, I think uh, it was already mentioned today that the, the long-term solution is not one fuel, one, one, one size does not fit all. It will be, uh, you know, a, a fuel mix. And depending on, um, you know, type of vessel, on voyage length, then I would, I would agree that, you know, on a s with smaller vessels, ferries operating on a, uh, on a short uh, voyages, may, maybe, uh, you know, batteries and some type of hy hybrid solutions may be the way forward. But I think the uh, engine manufacturers have realized uh, the dilemma which owners are facing, and they are coming up with solutions which may be suitable for various different types of fuel. Uh, there was a launch by one of the major manufacturers recently of a uh, containment system which said would be suitable for various different future fuels with a small modification. So anticipating that nobody has a crystal ball and we don't know what the fuel of the future is for each segment, uh, we know the considerations and what the challenges are, so uh, developing technologies that give some flexibility, I think, is, um, is the way forward. You know. Yes, uh, Fazali. How green are batteries in terms of production? Well, I don't know if I'm the right one to answer that. Uh, would probably be a question for the battery producers, but uh, I know that there has been raised some concerns about that, how, how green is the whole value chain. Uh, and, and obviously, to, to go with uh, electrification, you also have to, to consider how is the electricity produced, where does it come from? It doesn't make sense to, to fire up uh, uh, coal-based uh, uh, electric production of electricity if, 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 <laughs> if that's what you... So uh, it, it's a good question. You have to look at the whole whole value chain, but I guess that has to do with with the, the whole perspective on sustainability that we that we all uh, work on the on the different steps of, of every value chain in order to be more sustainable. That's, uh, yeah, absolutely. That's what uh, Pavan made a reference. You got to take the holistic picture from well to wake. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only then you can compare apples to apples. Yeah. Uh, any other question? Yes, sir, Ian. Uh, I have oh, a sorry. Yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, I can have my question a little bit later because it's also to Lars André, so maybe, maybe uh, André could uh, also maybe get a question before I ask mm -hmm. Lars. I, I propose that. Sorry. Okay? 
I can take my questions later because it's uh, to on a large uh, gimesta. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, I mean, uh, maybe Andrea could get that question first. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Ian. Please ask a Pavan this question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's me again, Ian from DNV. Actually, it's, sorry, it's a question um, primarily for Natalie. Um, whilst I'm all for progress, you know, I and DNV we don't believe that that should ever be at the expense of safety. Mm. And um, I mean, I I do believe in ammonia as a future fuel, uh, and I really admire everything Yara is doing in that respect but how can we manage the risk uh, posed by ammonia which is highly toxic yes uh, that actually that really fits in well with the earlier questions related to the bunkering as well because one of the reasons why Yara is very keen on um, entering that um, segment of being a physical supplier is partly to do with the fact that Yara has decades of experience in handling the ammonia safely. Safety records for ammonia handling are very good, but Yara wants to make sure that that record is preserved when it comes to bunkering the molecule. And um, within YCA, we have uh, somebody who's responsible for that side, and he, has, he represents 20 years of experience concerning the safety related to handling the molecule. Concerning the actual infrastructure development, obviously, there's, so there are two aspects to do with ammonia. One is that it's highly toxic, and the other one it, is that it is corrosive for certain materials. This essentially means two things. It means that the type of barriers that need to be considered when it comes to the ship and also the bunkering supplies need to be reconsidered for ammonia. They need to be strengthened. So, for example, double barriers. This is the process that currently uh, takes place when it comes to handling the ammonia from a trading point of view. The second, uh, um, again, it's about the materials that need to be used when it comes to um, producing the infrastructure that will allow the bunkering of ammonia. That said, from Yara's point of view, we do not see a showstopper. If we had seen a showstopper, we wouldn't have entered. And another point to make is that if ammonia is not safe enough to be used as a fuel, it will not be allowed to be used as a fuel. This is why we are using with, uh, we are collaborating with certification, Society, classification societies, certification companies. We are working with every single type of stakeholder in the chain to make sure that ammonia becomes a viable option, option as a fuel. Very good question, Ian. And from what I understood, uh, uh, Natalie, the risks associated with handling and storage of ammonia have been identified and addressed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Yara has a long experience in handling ammonia from that angle. Got it. Jamil. I'd just like to add to what Natalie said about ammonia. Um, going back um, several years uh, in KOTC fleet, we, um, we had LPG vessels which were carrying ammonia from time to time. Now, uh, like Natalie mentioned, it's corro apart from the hazards, uh, the toxicity, um, it's corrosive to certain bronze compounds. So it was always a worry from a technical standpoint of, you know, because usually our L LPG vessels uh, uh, were carrying um, propane and but uh, butane. So occasionally we get the, 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 you know, the instruction from our charters that the next cargo, we have to prepare the vessel for carrying ammonia. So if, you know, uh, in order to carry it safely, uh, the awareness of, uh, you know, the ship staff of the, of the various risks and how to handle them, such as not fitting bronze fittings in the cargo uh, setup, um, because that, that, so that was always the, the, the panic of the chief engineer 
and the cargo engineer that um, uh, if we had to carry an ammonia cargo, is is there somebody who has you know um, mistakenly fitted uh, fittings which um, would be fine for LPG for propane and butane, however would not be fine with ammonia, um, and because of the very low um, because of the toxicity issue and the low TLV values, in case there was any suspected uh, leaks, uh, additional precautions were taken like entering the compressor room on an LPG vessel with the breathing apparatus on, you know, full breathing apparatus. So I think if we could, if we could safely manage it going back to the 80s without any incident, then I think uh, nowadays it should be, uh, uh, I would agree with Natalie that we, we should be able to handle the, the safety issues. Very good. No one from here. Andre, I hope you can hear us. Uh, I noticed that you spoke about hybrid powered vessels, including battery powers. Now, if, if an old engineer like me went out to sea in one of those vessels, I'll be, I'll, I'll be lost at sea. What is your plan, or rather, what is Kongsberg's plan, if Kongsberg is doing this directly, on manning these vessels with suitable, suitably trained personnel who can handle these high-tech systems? You know, if you look at a battery system, it's, um, it's um, almost no maintenance needed for operating it. So you, it can last for 10 years almost without doing anything. But of course, there is, uh, there is risks associated with, with batteries on board. So it's very important that all the safety um, features are in place. And of course, the crew need to be able to handle the situation if if it happens, uh, so that you can terminate a, uh, a a thermal runaway and so on, so that they do this in in the right manner. Because that's what we have seen on some of the incidents that the crew is not um, competent enough to handle those situations. Neither does the fire crew on shore and so on. So that's probably the most important thing: uh, <clears throat> the safety when you put battery, batteries on board. Right. Uh, of course, uh, that was. I, I think what I like, what I could understand. We we only looking at short sea shipping, and therefore, maybe the intervention of a shipboard engineer might not be necessary. Is my understanding correct? Yeah, but as I said also in the presentation, you're probably going to see batteries also for for uh, for um, deep sea if you're going to go for alternative fuels, which doesn't those technologies doesn't support or it doesn't uh, handle load variations very good. So if you have a, a, a power plant with varying loads, probably you're going to need to have batteries anyway to handle those load variations. Yes, you did make reference to those peak loads. Yeah. 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 All right. Thanks for that. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, I don't have a technical question as such. I have more kind of a market-related question. And I, the question I would like to address to uh, Mr. Uh, Gimmestad from the Brothers O. Uh, <coughs> you, you showed in your presentation, Lars, uh, that uh, you are uh, also cooperating with Greek uh, stakeholders. You are going to, to uh, deliver uh, some vessels next year or the year after, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, what uh, else do you do internationally? Do you have any other uh, activities going on other places in the world? Uh, could you just elaborate a quickly on that, just for interest? Yeah, we have um, sort of a broad perspective on that. We, we, uh, we see that some of the solutions that we have uh, developed uh, in our home market now is, is, um, uh, is sort of uh, relevant for new markets uh, globally. And uh, that's why we are here. Uh, we want to investigate and see what uh, opportunities that may, uh, may, uh, may be found here in this area. But the strongest sort of footprint internationally now is, uh, is in China, where we ha have established a, a separate uh, or a new yard. And um, we have uh, uh, produced, for the last five years, we have delivered uh, some uh, close to 10 10 vessels of the type that you saw on the, in the presentation uh, for this for the Pearl River uh, area, which is a very sort of a dense area in terms of uh, passenger transport and, 
and high-speed ferries. Uh, and we also see in that market, in the Chinese market, that, um, that the, the focus on, on lower emission and, and uh, you know, sustainable and, and green uh, transport is also on the agenda very much. So, but to answer your question, we, we, we have certainly, we are very interested in now in exporting uh, the technology that we have faced in, in the Norwegian market. And, and uh, yeah, that's why we are, we are here basically to, to, to showcase our products and uh, what we can deliver. Very good. I noticed, uh, since, since you still have the mic, uh, Lars, in your, one of your fantastic videos, uh, I noticed that carbon fiber is being used as a shipbuilding material. How do you factor high temperature exposure? Typically, I'm talking about fires. Uh, and, and how can you segregate spaces and get the stamp from your friend who's sitting on your right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah we are very much under the scrutiny of, of uh, classification companies and authorities. Uh, the, the answer to that is that we um, well, carbon as, as such has a, has a very high sort of burning temperature. So it's, it's the resin, the, the glue that goes into it that is sort of uh, more exposed to, to, to that, um, that uh, hazard. But um, we, uh, we isolate the vessels. Uh, we, uh, we do all the precautions that we need to and we, we live up to the standards of, of uh, fire protection that is needed in all the different areas of the vessel. So, so uh, this is uh, developed uh, throughout the years together with the uh, DNB and, and, and others and uh, to, to, yeah, to, uh, to mitigate that risk. And, and we are totally compliant. Otherwise, we wouldn't allow passengers on board. Okay, <laughs> Majid, can, can you sort of, uh, I'm all thumbs at this, you know, every man has his strengths. So this ain't working. If you can give it to me, we'll take the online questions. Okay, so uh, you have, but have you all managed to get the necessary approval? Sorry, maybe I was not. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. We uh, <laughs> we started with the carbon fiber material in 2001. Uh, initially, like I mentioned, it was because uh, it it had a weight um, a benefit and, uh, and obviously then an en energy benefit. Moving into the sort of more sustainable and the more green um, focus that has sort of emerged for the last years suddenly these vessels were also optimal in re with respect to the environment. So, uh, so the, the lightweighted material has sort of proven to be very interesting for these kind of applications where, where um, energy efficiency is, is crucial. Um, so we have delivered some 70 vessels uh, to date in carbon fiber, so they are, they are very much in the market <laughs> already. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Majid. Wow, we have some online questions, and they're talking about batteries. But I think I'll give you a break for a second. Let me uh, let me go to ammonia. Yeah, and uh, the question from an unnamed source says, "How does the energy efficiency of ammonia production compare to alternative energy options?" Yeah, much like what Fazal asked, but more specifically now uh, for you, Natalie. As already said, um, yeah, alternative fuels tend to be less energy dense than what we are using today. And that has a number of implications, one of them being bunkering locations, which again can be seen as a supply, supply side constraint. Because obviously the m more areas you have options to bunker, um, the, the less capex may be involved in you um, retrofitting your vessel to use ammonia or even in the new build context. But that said, uh, methanol and ammonia are relatively similar in energy density. So if we're talking about possible alternative fuels, ammonia and methanol, d depending of course on what type of report you read because there are different statistics out there. But that said, overall, you can say that from an energy density point of view, methanol and ammonia are similar. They are both more energy dense than hydrogen, and that is partly the reason why ammonia is considered as a better solution to carry hydrogen than hydrogen itself, but less energy dense than other alternatives, which of course have the downside of not being as green as ammonia. So essentially, there's a give and take in each option, and from an energy density perspective, the two, let's say, 
prominent contenders, methanol and ammonia, relatively equal. Mm, interesting. Thanks, uh, Natalie. Uh, Jamil, I would have, I had my own question regarding a ship owner's perspective, but let's uh, let's look at this um, question from from a, a really good one. We've not heard too much today about wind propulsion. Are you all considering the benefits of wind propulsion combined with your own solutions? But before anybody else jumps in, uh, Jamil, like I said, from a ship owner's perspective, have you? Yes, we have been uh, in talks with uh, a certain uh, manufacturer uh, or solution provider. Um, uh, but that's more of, uh, as opposed to being the main propulsion system, uh, an aid to the propulsion, making the overall propulsion system more efficient, you know, by reducing your, uh, you know, uh, by increasing your efficiency and reducing your consumption, obviously. So, uh, whereas the, the long term, we're looking at, uh, you know, uh, a drastic change to something else. I mean, there's many different things we can do today to make our operations more efficient. But it still will not get alone. Will not get us to the the ultimate target of uh, net zero. Yeah. Cal. Can I jump Natalie? in? Please I just do. wanted to say, uh, from Yara Clean Ammonia's perspective, we're looking at ammonia, but our um, Yara Marine Technologies um, is very geared towards wind propulsion as an option. So anybody interested. Um, please do come to our stand because that is exactly what we're focusing on as one of our solutions as, uh, in the context of what Yara Marine Technologies is doing. Uh, speaking of Yara Marine, has your Yara Berkland, has it already been, uh, is it in, in service already? Yes. I thought I heard that in the news. Uh, it was in Oslo a couple of weeks back and operations are planned to start next year. Next year, all right, mm. okay, good luck with that. Yeah, well, uh, let's jump back into batteries. You got your break. <laughs> Batteries are notoriously inefficient energy storage, inefficient energy storage method, and are themselves not a long-term sustainable option. What are the panel's thoughts on this, and if there are the beta max of energy, and if they are the beta max of energy? I thought I said don't make long questions, but, uh, <laughs> but you're smarter than me. You should, uh, I'll be happy to read again. Batteries are a notoriously inefficient energy storage method and are themselves not a long-term sustainable option. So that's more or less a statement. Yeah. Now comes the question. What are the panelists' thoughts, all of you, on this and if they are the beta max of energy? Beta max. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, um, I, I think many would, uh, would uh, disagree on that point of view, but um, when you're looking at the energy needed to uh, to produce hydrogen or ammonia, there is a lot of electricity going into, or energy going into those processes as well. Uh, if you look at uh, hydrogen, you you uh, do two conversions where you you make the hydrogen and then you convert it back to electricity, and and there is an energy loss on mm -hmm. the way uh, uh, in those two conversions. And with with batteries, you are practically storing all the energy that you, you uh, if you get it from, from, from energy production like hydro, hydropower, you, you basically store pretty much all the energy that you are producing. So it's not inefficient as such, in my point of view. Uh, but obviously in, um, it's, it's um, inefficient in, in terms of weight compared to energy, the energy uh, or the energy density, so mm. that needs to be improved, uh, obviously, in order to sort of make it a, a good solution for for high speed and sure. long range passenger transport. Okay, Dusan Tak, Mr. Kimmerstad, and before I move to uh, nuclear power, any questions from the floor? Right. So this one's, a, you know, here comes a curveball. What do panelists think about the viability of nuclear powered vessels? Natalie has, so has I can an opinion. kick off by talking about nuclear power in the context of the energy required to generate <laughs> ammonia as a fuel, because it is actually, that is what is called uh, yellow. So 
let's start with the <laughs> options. So currently we have uh, gray ammonia, which is powered by natural gas. And we then have an option of blue ammonia, which is essentially natural gas, but with the carbon captured and stored. Now there are various elements or options within that blue spectrum but that is a conversation in itself. Then we have green, which is um, renewable energy powered hydrogen produced that is then making the ammonia. And we have yellow ammonia, which is powered by nuclear. The issue with respect to the, these different options, including um, the generation of energy through nuclear, as well as other options with respect to blue, has to do with certain things. One is the taxonomy and taxonomy related regulations that might be coming up in the European context, but maybe more broadly. Essentially, what is considered green and what is genuinely green and what is being called green but is not considered genuinely green. This is all part of the regulation and the considerations around the regulations that are being developed. I don't ha I'm not privy to insider information about what regulators are thinking with respect to nuclear, but I do understand that there are some concerns around nuclear that are n will not necessarily be uh, tackled very quickly partly as a result of uh, historical considerations, partly as a result of uh, technology and so forth. That said, um, it, it is an option that is being considered from an ammonia point of view as well. It's just a matter of understanding where the regulators are uh, going, where the private sector is going, and making sure that there's not too much deviation between one and the other um, before massive investments are made. Yeah, super. I'm going to have the last question to uh, Jamil before we wind up, uh, but anybody else is most welcome to uh, jump in. As a ship owner, and I consider you guys as the top of the food chain, and that's why everybody's here, to be honest, uh, what was KOTC's approach towards decarbonization? Um, yeah, well, we can't look at it in one, uh, you know, quick sweep. Yeah. It is. Uh, obviously um, broken down. In the short term, many things are already being done. I mean, we adopted the uh, energy efficiency, uh, ISO energy efficiency standard 50001 several years back, and our drive towards running the fleet more efficiently. Um, there's many operational measures you can do. There's many um, from the design stage you can do to make the vessels, I mean, vortex generators, pre-swell stators, you know, I mean, the, you know, as ships have evolved, you know, and um, ship propulsion systems, the, 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 they have, uh, the ratio between bore and stroke has drastically changed, which means a slower operating speed, a larger diameter, highly skewed propeller, um, all add to the propulsion efficiency of a vessel um, but then, you know, as mentioned today, you know, just on time arrivals, um, vir or virtual arrivals, which need just a little bit of coordination between the stakeholders. Who wants the ship to sit for one week, you know, at Anchorage when it could have slowed down and saved so much, uh, you know, fuel and also the reduce the carbon footprint drastically. So. Um, you know, uh, weather routing, uh, trim, trim optimization, all there's, a, there's a, you know, basket of measures that can be adopted operationally and from the initial design of the vessel. So that is where we are today. Uh, moving forward, you know, um, then is, is, it gets a bit more tricky with all these challenges that have been discussed today. So it is, maybe mind-boggling that's why um you know and, and it's um multi-taceted so that's why collaboration is the way forward i think governments have to support it incentivize it it's not just you know a carrot and a stick but uh, you know uh forward-thinking countries can drive this change and support it you know and you know there's the commercial aspect also we, we've talked about the technical aspect the, the cost of the fuel, you know, 
Now, as a sh from a shipowner's perspective, you say, well, if if our fleet is on time charter, so the, the you know the the charter is picking up the tab for the fuel, but that's not technically correct because, okay, he does pick up the tab indirectly, but actually, if you go a little bit deeper, you realize that you're paying for it. Um, it's deducted off your you know uh, charter charter. charter rate, uh, so to speak. Um, so. You know, the cost is an important thing, but I think um, that can be shared between, you know, the, the stakeholders. Um, if we see the drive towards electric vehicles in Europe and Norway especially, it is because of the incentives provided by the Norwegian government that it's actually, you know, the most electric vehicles in the world you'll find in Oslo, right? <laughs> and it's not because, you know, the, the tax, um, uh, cuts uh, or exemptions from adopting, uh, you know, electric vehicles is one of the drivers, uh, along with uh, many other drivers, which uh, the government sort of adopted to steer uh, uh, into that in that direction. So, um, you know, it's coming, but slowly, and uh, uh, technology has to develop, and also all the other parts have to be there. I mean, we talked about uh, cold ironing or uh, shore supply, you know, ship plugging in. Now, you know, you, as a ship owner, you can, uh, you can go for these technologies, but the, the important thing is the ship shore interface. If the ports don't have the facility, then these ships might go to scrap, never used. So that's where it's a bit daunting for ship owners, you know. You don't want to invest in some technology not knowing where the other st what the other stakeholders are doing. So it has to be a joint uh, project. Collaboration again. Collaboration. Uh, Lars, was it something you'd like yeah, to say? I, yeah, I, I just wanted to say that many good points uh, from Jamil there. And, uh, and I just thought that I, I, I didn't want to sort of leave stage and, and with the impression that we are all into batteries because we, <laughs> we are a shipyard and we are obviously uh, constructing vessels uh, with the best available technology, regardless of uh, what direction it takes. It takes the green direction, but but uh, we are obviously open to to um, to those uh, energy carrying solutions that that come. So, just want to make that point. And at the same time, like Jamil said, the collaboration part here is crucial. That we, as a shipyard, have good partners and good. Um, uh, good col uh, collaboration both on the customer side with the operators but also on the supply side with all the technolo technology suppliers that are out there. That's really important and with that respect this, this session is important to exchange knowledge and, and views. It's, it's, uh, it's very important to get the good, uh, good end result. But when I get the body language that you'd like to say something. Oh. No, no, not really. Okay. I think uh, some really great answers by the fellow panelists yep. and I can't agree more with each of them and yeah. like you said it's collaboration and I'm learning as well. <laughs> yeah, <So> super. <laughs> In fact you took the finishing words out of my mouth. Yeah. Collaboration and best available technology. Yeah. Pawan, Lars, Natalie, Jamil, thank you so much. Shukran, Dhanyawad, uh, Tusantak, right? Ladies and gentlemen please join me in giving them a round of applause to our appreciation. Right, uh, the next panel discussion is at 1400. Uh, so please be back here uh, and I hope you found this discussion valuable. All right, all the best. <laughs>